to introduce Gabor, um, who needs no introduction, of course. Um, he is well known for his work in machine learning, empirical processes, probabilistic inequalities, random graphs, combinatorial statistics, you name it. Um, and in addition to all, all this research, he is a great expositor. And uh, I personally owe a debt of gratitude for uh, his books as a grad student. The probabilistic theory of pattern recognition was on my desk all the time. Uh, the combinatorial methods for density estimation as well. Um, as a postdoc, prediction learning and games really changed my life. Um, uh, and uh, you know, as I got older, new books came out. Consideration inequalities has been uh, since you know 2013 on my desk. Um, and uh, today he will present um, a, a number of results on estimating the mean of a random vector. And there is a nice survey that some of the students read. Um, and uh, as always, that's a great exposition. So looking forward to your talk, Gabor. Thanks so much, Sasha. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, so, so today I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to tell you a few things about uh, estimating the mean of a, of a random vector. So this is, uh, this is really, um, one of the most basic uh, statistical problems, if not the most basic one. Uh, sorry, Sasha, how much time do I have? Um, you have essentially until 12, but maybe uh, stop a few minutes okay. for a question. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so I'll, I'll be, I, uh, most of the talk is based on, uh, on, on joint work with Shahar Mendelssohn, who is at the Austrian uh, National University. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so here's the, the really the most basic statistical problem, uh, and, and for now, uh, at, at, in the first half of the of the talk or the first first twenty minutes, we are in, in one dimension. So the, even though the title of the of the talk is estimating the, the mean of a random vector, uh, here we are in one dimension. So we have real uh, random variables x one x n, and uh, what we assume is that the, the, the expected value exists and, the, and it's, it's denoted by uh, it's denoted by mu. Um, now uh, there, there's no tricks. Oh, uh, the, the data are, are completely uh, observable, and uh, there are no missing data or, or no censored. So these are just independent, identically distributed copies. So this is really the, the cleanest setup. So what do we do? How do we, uh, how, how do we estimate uh, the expectation? Well, uh, the obvious choice is, uh, is the empirical mean. Okay. Just uh, the average of these random variables. And <clears throat> there's this beautiful, and so now uh, we want to know how, how good this estimator is. Okay. Now, if we don't want to assume anything else, uh, apart from the uh, existence of the, of the expected value, then there's not much we can say. Well, we have the, the strong low large numbers that that's an asymptotic statement that says that the empirical mean converges to the, uh, to the, uh, to the true expectation, but, uh, but, but there's, no, uh, there, there's not much else we can say. So, but if we assume just a little bit more that, that the variance is finite, okay, here, uh, then we have this beautiful, uh, also very classical uh, theorem, the central limit theorem, that, that tells us that the, uh, that the rate of convergence is, is about uh, one over square root of n. And moreover, we have this very nice uh, asymptotic inequality that says that if, uh, if uh, the sample size goes to infinity, then square root of n times uh, the difference between the, the, the empirical mean and, and the true mean uh, is at most sigma, which is the, uh, the, uh, the standard deviation, times something like square root of log one over delta. Okay, and this happens with probability. Uh, so, so this difference will be at most, uh, at most this quantity with probability uh, one minus delta. Okay, uh, but this is of course uh, an asymptotic statement. So it says that eventually, if n is very, very large, then, then something like this will happen, but we don't know how large uh, and has to be. So it would be nice to have uh, non-asymptotic inequalities, okay? And uh, to, to get non-asymptotic inequalities, we need to assume a little bit more. So for example, if the distribution is sub-Gaussian, so what the sub-Gaussian means, it means that the, uh, the, uh, the moment generating function of the random variable written here, sorry, I, uh, I have to get used to 
uh, drawing on the tablet. So, so here's the, the moment generating function. Um, it's bounded by the moment generating function of, the, of, of, of a normal random variable. Then by, by simple churn of bounds, we have a non-asymptotic version of the central limit theorem. Okay, so if the distribution is sub-Gaussian, then, then this, is, this inequality is true for every n. Okay, so wouldn't it be nice to have uh, non-asymptotic inequalities of this form, uh, if, even if the, the distribution is not sub-Gaussian? Okay, so. uh, <clears throat> now, unfortunately, the empirical mean is not, is not, a, not a good estimator in, in this sense. Uh, um, even though it's computationally very simple, computing the empirical mean is trivial, uh, the problem is that if we don't have a sub-Gaussian distribution, then all we, all we can say is what we get from Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, so uh, in the rest of the talk, I will assume that the, that the second moment of the random variable exists. Okay, so the variance is assumed to exist. Uh, and I, I will try to explain why, why this, is a, this is a reasonable assumption and, and why this assumption is somehow interesting. Okay. But we don't want to assume anything else. Okay, so in particular, we, we want to allow for, for heavy tails. So if we, if we, uh, if we uh, allow for heavy tails, then Chebyshev's inequality is, is still true, okay, so which is a non-asymptotic inequality. It still tells us that the, the, the error scales as sigma divided by square root of n, but the dependence uh, on, on delta, which is the confidence, is exponentially worse, okay? And unfortunately, this is actually necessary. So, uh, so uh, this is the best one can say if, uh, if we are not willing to assume more than the second moment. Okay, so, so the, uh, the, for, for every delta, one can easily construct a distribution such that uh, the probability that the, the empirical mean is more than sigma over uh, root n delta away from the mean is bigger than delta, okay? So the empirical mean doesn't do it if we are after, so, uh, so it doesn't, it's it, in a sense exponentially worse, the situation is exponentially worse than, uh, than in the sub-Gaussian case, okay? So the question is, are there maybe other estimators that, uh, that behave better? And the, the kind of surprising answer is yes. Uh, and uh, I will show you today two different, two very simple estimators that actually have a sub-Gaussian non-asymptotic performance. Okay, and without, without any uh, more uh, assumption than the, than the finite, finite variance. Okay, so the first one is the so-called median of means estimator. And this is, this estimator, even though it's, it, it's uh, no long time. So it is, this was independently discovered by smart people like Nambrovsky and Judin and Jerome Valli and Barziani, Alo Matthias and Segedi in, in different contexts. Uh, it's, it's only recently that, that it somehow this became widely known and widely understood. Okay? The, the, the estimator is really, sim really simple. What we do is that we, uh, we take our data and data points and we form blocks, uh, random blocks of, of size M. Okay? Now in each block we compute uh, the empirical mean of the, uh, of the uh, uh, of the data we have in each block, and now we just take the median. Okay, this is the, the median of means algorithm. Okay, so it it has a it has a, a, a parameter that's this uh, that's this m. All right, so it's it's very simple. So let's see uh, what we can say. Well, we have this this really simple and beautiful uh, inequality that that says that if we choose the the block size. Uh, so the, the block size M, right? If we choose it uh, appropriately, depending on delta, it's, that's the confidence level that, uh, that we aim at, then uh, we have a purely sub-Gaussian uh, inequality, meaning that the, 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 the probability at least one minus delta, the difference uh, uh, between the estimator and the true mean is bounded by exactly of the kind of inequality that we, we hope for, sigma divided by root n times square root of log one over delta. Okay, so instead of the root one over delta that, that Chebyshev's inequality gave us, this is really what the central limit theorem suggests. Okay, I will show you the proof because it's really just two lines. Uh, this is it, this is the proof. So <clears throat> first note that uh, in, within each block, we can use Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, so in particular, 
within each block, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the empirical mean in, in a block is within distance sigma over square root of m, m is the block size of the, of the, of the true mean with probability, let's say, uh, three fourths. Okay, so very five percent. So what does this mean? This means that the, that the majority of the blocks should be good. So that means that if you take the median, right? So if, let's say, here's the median and, and here's the two, true mean. Now, if, this is, if these guys are far away, then it means that at least half of the blocks are also far away from the mean, right? If this is the mu, this is mu and this is mu hat. So I'm sorry for the ugly writing. So if these guys were, were to be far, then it means that at least half of the points are also far, but half of the points cannot be far because each one of them is close with probability 75% and they are independent, right? So the probability that, uh, that at least half of them are here is bounded by the probability that the binomial with, with, uh, with the parameters k, which is the number of blocks we have, and one fourth, which is, which is the probability of error, is bigger than k half. Okay, and so k is log, remember, k is log one over delta. So this is exponentially small, and so this is, this is just delta. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the proof. Are there any questions? Uh, how, how, do, how do we do the questions or the interruptions? Okay. Um, I, I guess uh, I just go on until Sasha interrupts me. <laughs> okay, so so that, that's that's the median median of means estimator, which is uh, which is really nice and surprisingly simple, and and, and gives this this beautiful um, uh, this beautiful uh, non-asymptotic sub-Gaussian inequality. Okay, it's nice that uh, so remember there is a parameter. The parameter is delta. Okay. That, that the estimator needs to know in advance. So if you want an estimator that works 99% uh, with, with probability delta equals 0 0.1, then I, I give you an estimator. But if you want an estimator that works, works with probability uh, 0 0.01, it's a different estimator. Okay, so the, the, the estimator depends on delta and uh, I'm not gonna go into that, but th such a dependence is actually uh, necessary. Okay, in, 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 sense, in some sense. So we can't expect uh, sub-Gaussian estimators that, that, that work for all deltas that are actually, uh, that, uh, uh, that are sub-Gaussian. Okay. Um, all right, uh, the, another nice property of the, of the uh, median of means uh, algorithm, median of means uh, estimator is that it actually works, uh, the exact same estimator works even when, when the uh, variance is infinite, so if we have for example, if we have some moments of, of order one plus alpha for some alphas less than one, then we get, uh, we get a, a little bit worse rate, right? Here we get alpha divided by one, one plus alpha, right? If alpha equals one, that's when the variance exists. So then, then we get uh, the one over uh, root n rate and, and we get this, okay? Moreover, this is the best one can, one can actually do, okay? So, so in fact, you can show that, uh, that, that this bound that I just showed you is, is minimax optimal in the sense that, uh, that for any M and for any alpha and for any delta, which is not, uh, you, you can have even exponentially, exponentially small deltas, one can easily construct a distribution whose one plus alpha's moment equals M and such that any estimator uh, will be, uh, will have an error which is bounded by, and this is exactly the form that we saw in the previous slide. Okay, so the median of means estimator, and the proof of this is, is trivial. It's, it's, it's here, it's, anyways, I'm, I'm not gonna go into that. It's, it's, it's in, the, in the survey that Sasha mentioned. Okay, so the median of, of means estimator is, is, is optimal in a, in, in a kind, kind of strong sense, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, it also, uh, so let me just go back here. So, so you can also see that, uh, that we only get uh, rates of one over square, square root of n if the second moment exists. So if the second moment doesn't exist, then there's no hope to get rates one over square root of n. But as soon as the second moment exists, we actually get sub-Gaussian rates. Okay. Moreover, it's not hard, and this, uh, this was proved by Olivier Katonin, that, uh, that for, for uh, actually Gaussian distribution, uh, you cannot do better than, uh, 
than the empirical mean. And the empirical mean, we understand it perfectly, it has exactly Gaussian errors in that case. Okay, so, so if the second moment exists, then we can get uh, uh, the sub-Gaussian uh, inequalities. And if the second, uh, and, and otherwise, if we, if we want to get any, uh, any estimator that actually works optimally for, the, uh, for, for Gaussians, then, uh, then we cannot hope anything better. Okay? So in, in this sense, this is, uh, this is why uh, assuming this, the second moment makes a lot of sense, because in that case, we get this gigantic class of distributions in which we, 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 can, uh, we can get the sub-Gaussian rate, and we cannot really hope whether it's than sub-Gaussians, un unless we have some really special distributions, like the uniform distribution, in which case we know that we can have even 1 over n rates. We can, but, but if you want an estimator that works for a class of distributions that includes the Gaussians, then for free, we can just go to the, the, the class of all distributions with the second moment exists. Okay? All right. Now here's uh, another very simple estimator, and this is even older than, uh, than the median of means estimator. This is the so-called trim mean. So this is what all practitioners actually has, uh, have been using. This is the so-called trim mean estimator. So if, you, uh, if a statistician worries about outliers, okay, heavy tails, of course, uh, produce outliers, then, uh, then what uh, every practitioner does is just you just discard the outliers. This, you say, well, th those are, those are mean meaningless measurements. So you just trim the smallest certain, uh, smallest, let's say, n epsilon, smallest number of, uh, of uh, points and the n epsilon largest uh, points and take the empirical average of the rest. Okay, that's the trim mean estimator. It goes way back to the, to the classical uh, uh, era of, uh, of, of robust statistics. There are some references here. But it was only proved very recently, and uh, this hasn't been published. Uh, the, I, I'm going to show you the proof, but, the, but uh, it's Roberto Oliveira who showed me this, this result. They never actually wrote it up. But uh, uh, I, I will show you a version of this result that says that if we choose the trimming uh, the, the, the trimming, uh, the amount of trimming correctly, uh, meaning that we chop off log one over delta points from the left and log one over delta points from the right and take the empirical average, then the trim mean is actually uh, sub Gaussian in, in the same sense as we saw before. Okay? Which is really nice. So we only have to lose a constant number of points, right? If, if delta is a constant, it's just log one over delta points from the left and from the right. And show you of this for, for, uh, for uh, a simple version of, uh, of, uh, of, of this estimator, just because the proof is, is simpler for this version. Okay? So, so in, this, in, this, in this version of the trim mean estimator, what we do is that we take, we split the data into two halves. So, so I just assume that, uh, that we have x1 to xn, and y1 to yn, so we have two endpoints, okay? So these are just the, uh, the two end data points we have. And we use these y1, y1 to yn, to estimate the empirical quantize. So this S epsilon, remember from the first previous slide, this epsilon is, is gonna be log one over, uh, del so, sorry, epsilon n is log one over delta, okay? It's, uh, n times epsilon is log one over delta, okay? So, so we, we take, uh, so these y stars are just the order statistics. Okay? So uh, alpha is the epsilon nth smallest uh, point among these y1 to yn, and uh, beta is the one minus uh, is the epsilon nth largest point. Okay? So these are this is how we estimate somehow the, the, the these are the empirical quantize. Okay? And now what we do is that we we just trim. Oops, sorry. We just trim. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we take uh, this function, phi, that's plotted here, okay? Remember, alpha and beta are, are these chopping levels that we determine on the first half of the data. And, and we, just, uh, we, just, uh, we just flatten it out at alpha and we flatten it out at beta and, and take the empirical average of that based on the, on the, on, on, on the x1, x sense, okay? So this is like a trend mean. So on the first half of the data, we, we estimate the, the, the quantize and uh, the, the epsilon and the one minus epsilon quantize, and we just take 
all the points that are in between them and take the empirical average, okay? And, uh, and the, 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 the simple inequality is, is written here that this estimator is also a uh, sub-Gaussian, okay? Exactly in the same sense as the, as the previous one, okay? We get sigma over root n times log one over delta. <coughs> all right, so here's the proof. Um, so first, uh, it's very easy to see, this is just Bernstein's inequality, that the empirical quantiles are accurate to, to this level, okay? So the em epsilon empirical quantile, if this, remember, uh, this epsilon is log one over delta over n. So, uh, so in this range, we can make sure that with probability e to the minus epsilon n, which is, which is, uh, which is this is delta, right? So with probability one minus delta, uh, the, the empirical quantile is correct, right? It's, cor it's correct up, up to this, right? It, so we, we're trying to estimate the epsilon quantile, and we're gonna be between the epsilon half and the, and the two epsilon quantile. And the same for beta, okay? And now uh, we, we decompose the difference, right? Between, between the estimator and the, uh, and the, and the true value. Uh, so we take the expectation of, of, of this truncation function, right? Well, this expectation is with respect to, to the x, right? So alpha and beta, remember, they are random variables depending on the y. So, so this is a random variable here, but anyways, uh, so this is the conditional expectation minus mu. And then, uh, and, and here, this is just the empirical average minus the, the expectation, okay? So you can see that the, this, uh, this second part, the estimation error, this is just a, a simple empirical average and we can, we can uh, deal with it just using uh, Bernstein's inequality, okay? And, uh, and, and for, the, for the bias, well, that's also very simple because the, the bias is, so you see this, uh, this function phi, remember this is just the, uh, this rectified, rectified linear unit. Okay. Uh, this only dip, uh, differs from, from, the, uh, from the identity function if x is smaller than alpha or if x is big, bigger than beta, okay? So, so there are two contributors to this, to this difference. When x is smaller than alpha, then it's x minus alpha, and when x is bigger than beta, then it's, it's uh, x minus beta, okay? Now, uh, alpha, because, because of the, of, of the uh, previous inequality, alpha is smaller than uh, q2 epsilon, so I, I can replace it back to q epsilon, and it's, uh, the same thing for beta, okay? So, what, so how do we, how do we uh, bound, let's say the, let's say the sorry, the, the second term here, Okay. These two terms are, are completely symmetrical. So, uh, so here I just uh, add and subtract mu, right? So we, we just center. And we have these two terms. The first term, we can use Cauchy-Schwarz. Okay. And, and, and the second term here, well, the second term here is this is just a constant and this is the expected value of this indicator, which is just the probability that X is bigger than Q one minus epsilon, which is just, well, Q is the quantile, right? So this is just two epsilon. So here, the second term X was two epsilon times the distance between the quantile and mu, right? That's there. And for the, sec for the first term, we use Cauchy-Schwarz. So we have, uh, we have the, the variance, right, square root of the variance, times square root of the expected value of this indicator, which is that. But this is again epsilon, so here we get sigma times square root of epsilon. And the second term is also sigma times square root of epsilon because by Chebyshev's inequality, the, uh, the difference between the quantile and, and, uh, and, and the mean is at most sigma over square root of epsilon, okay? And that's it, this, this is the proof, right? This is, this is uh, remember, epsilon is, uh, log one over delta divided by n, so this is exactly the right, right quantity. Okay. All right. So I hope this is clear. Uh, so this is uh, the very simple analysis of, of the trim mean. <clears throat> now the beauty of the trim mean is that it, actually it is robust not only uh, for uh, for uh, heavy fields, but it's also robust for contaminated data. And it's robust in, in, a, in a very strong sense. So there's this model uh, called adversarial contamination model in which, uh, in which an adversary uh, can, uh, can inspect the data. Uh, and, uh, and, and the adversary is allowed to change eta times n data points in an arbitrary way. 
Okay? The adversary knows the estimator we want to use. It, it can do anything. Okay? But now the tree mean, uh, if we choose now epsilon to be uh, some, the maximum of eta and log one over delta over n, well, a constant times that. Okay? So eta is the contamination level and log one over delta divided by n is what we had before. Okay? Then uh, the exact same analysis. Really, uh, you can go back uh, and just look at what I did. And, and you see that, that uh, this eta fraction is not going to change anything. So the, the same analysis goes through. And what we get is that with, uh, with probability one minus delta, the error of the trim mean estimator is bounded by sigma time. So this is the second term is what we had before. And the first term, the, the, what the, the price we pay for contamination is sigma times square root of eta. Okay. And it's, it's very easy to see that this is exactly uh, the right quantity. You cannot hope to replace the square root of eta by, by anything else. If, we, if, if, the, if the tails can be, uh, if, 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 the, if the only thing we're uh, willing to assume is, uh, is a second moment, okay? Because, because, uh, be, because essentially because, uh, because you, can, uh, you can just modify the distribution by uh, a, a little bit by, by random data and, and you're, you're, you won't be able to distinguish between uh, contamination and, and, and actual, uh, actual uh, distribution. Okay, so this is the best you can do. If uh, you have, we have light tails, if for example, higher movements exist, then the square root of, the, of, of eta becomes better. For example, for if in, in the extreme case, when we have a sub-Gaussian distribution, then the square root of eta impro gets improved to, to almost eta, eta times square root of log one over eta. Okay, and, uh, and that is close to, to optimal, uh, but that, that is actually optimal for, for sub Gaussian distributions. Okay. So, uh, so, so that's really nice. That's a, that's a very good, uh, strong property of, uh, of, uh, of trimmed mean. And I don't think this property holds for, for the median of mean estimators. Okay. So in this sense, uh, the, uh, um, the trimmed mean is, is a more robust estimate. Okay. So uh, now, now I'm coming to the main topic of this talk, uh, which is the multivariate case. Okay, so the question is exactly the same as before. We have n independent uh, random vectors, okay? IID vectors. So, so, so now we go to RD and uh, the, the mean is, is denoted by mu, which is a vector now. And, uh, and the, the second moment is, is assumed to exist. So the, uh, the covariance matrix of is, is denoted by sigma, okay? And now <coughs> we would again like to have an est mean estimator that are sub-Gaussian and this only assumption that the second moment exists, okay? But of course now, what does it mean that, that, uh, that an estimate is sub-Gaussian? In, in the, uh, the one-dimensional case, that's what, this was quite natural. Uh, which the, the, the tails just should go down as, a, as, as, a, as the normal distribution. But what's, what's a, a sub-Gaussian distri sub performance in this case? Well, we can go back to what happens in the Gaussian case, okay? And, uh, and, 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 and get guidance from, from there. So, uh, so consider now uh, when the case when X is a multivariate Gaussian. And, and let's look at the, uh, the, the empirical mean, which is the best one can do for Gaussians, okay? <clears throat> So in this case, it's really easy to see that, uh, with, that we have this uh, inequality, okay? So with probability one minus delta, the, uh, the Euclidean distance between, between the mean uh, and, and the empirical mean is bounded by square root of uh, the trace of the covariance matrix, the Frobenius norm of the covariance matrix divided by n plus square root of twice the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix, so the operator norm times log one over delta over n. Okay, so this sometimes we call this the strong term and this is the weak term. Okay. So wh why is this true? Well, this is very easy to see because you see the, uh, the uh, uh, mu, mu and hat, uh, sorry, mu and bar is a, is, is a Gaussian, right? It's a multivariate Gaussian. So, so this is just a multivariate Gaussian vector. The expected value of the norm squared, well, that's exactly the, the trace of sigma divided by n. Okay, so this uh, the, the the expectation is bounded by this first term, 
And uh, the second term is, is just uh, the, the random fluctuations and which you can bound by the, uh, by the, uh, by the Gaussian concentration inequality, right? Because, uh, because the norm is a Lipschitz function of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the Gaussians. Okay, so Lipschitz functions of a Gaussian, uh, of a Gaussian vector are concentrated and you can use, and the Lipschitz constant is, is, is just, uh, is just lambda max. Okay, so it's really nice that we have these, these, these two uh, terms. This is somehow the expectation. This is the, uh, this, this comes from the random fluctuations. So now the natural question is, can we construct mean estimators that have this kind of uh, performance without any uh, assumptions of Gaussianity or anything of that sort, okay? And the answer is yes, but, but let, let's, let's go there uh, little by little, uh, baby steps. So of course, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the, maybe the first idea that you might have is, is let's, uh, let's look at, uh, well, let's just generalize the median of means estimator, okay? So let's look at uh, the high dimensional versions of the median of means. Yeah, so what does that mean? Remember, median of means, we form blocks of the data, we compute the empirical mean within each block, and now these empirical means are vectors in our d-dimensional space, and now we take the median. But what's the median in, in Rd? Well, there are several notions. So for example, you can take the coordinate-wise median, right? So we, along each coordinate, we compute the median, and, and that give, gives us a, a vector. Another one is the so-called geometric median. That's another notion of, uh, of, the, uh, of the median where, uh, where we minimize the sum of the, uh, of the Euclidean distances to the, uh, to, uh, to, to the data points. Right? And the, the vector that minimizes this distance, that's called the geometric median. Another uh, generalization of the, uh, the one-dimensional median is you may take the center of the smallest ball that contains at least half of the data points. Okay. That's another notion of, of a multivariate median. There's, uh, there are many, many notions. There's the, the so-called Tukey median, if, if you heard about that. And, and, uh, and, and I will introduce a, a kind of new notion of a median here, which, which will be somehow the right one for our purposes. But, let, but let's, let's go, uh, let's see what uh, these things. So, if we take the coordinate wise median, then we can just use the union bound and, and it's really easy to see that, uh, that we do have a, a kind of sub gaussian -ish inequality. So what we get is, uh, is that the, the Euclidean distance is bounded by the square root of the trace of the covariance matrix times log D. Now this D comes from taking the union bound over the D directions divided by delta over M, okay? This is not really satisfactory for several reasons. First of all, we don't like this D here, right? But there's, there's, not, there's no, there's no dimension without an inequality. I don't know if you can see, you see, there's no dimension here. So in fact, this is an infinite dimensional inequality. Okay, so it would be nice to avoid uh, the appearance of, of D. And, uh, and the other problem is that, uh, is that uh, the log one over delta is here multiplied by, by the trace and not by just the largest eigenvalue. And the trace can be much, much bigger than the largest eigenvalue. So this is, this is not kind of far from the sub Gaussian inequality that we're hoping for. Uh, now, if, if we take some other notions of the, of the median, for example, the smallest ball median, right? So remember, the smallest ball, we, we are looking for the, 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 the smallest ball that contains at least half of the data points and we take the center of that. Now that is already uh, has this uh, infinite dimension of flavor. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the error, the Euclidean distance is bounded by the square root of the trace times log one over delta, there's no D here divided by M. Okay, so this is almost sub Gaussian, but it's not quite, okay. Um, the proof is really simple and I have it on the next slide, but I'm not gonna, I'm running out of time. I wanna uh, keep it, uh, you, you can, it's, it's a simple exercise. So you can, you can try to do it yourself, okay? Uh, and the disadvantage of this algorithm is finding the smallest ball is computationally hard, okay? But you can uh, actually uh, replace it by the geometric median, which is the solution of a convex optimization pro problem. This can be solved actually uh, uh, almost in linear time, so this is really nice. 
and it satisfies the same kind of uh, same kind of inequality, okay? which has this sub Gaussian flavor, but it's not quite sub Gaussian, right? And we would like to have a sum here, not right. The, the log one over delta should be multiplied by by the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix, and not by the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay, uh, this inequality was proved by 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 uh, Stas Minsker, and uh, and and this. Uh, Ge geometric median uh, was studied by uh, Daniel Siu and Sabato and uh, okay. okay so here's uh, <coughs> here's our proposal and this this comes from uh, my paper with Shahar uh, well it appeared a year ago but this, this goes back a few years um, which we called a uh, median of means tournament and this was the first estimator that was uh, provably sub Gaussian in the, in the sense that I uh, that I mentioned. So, <clears throat> so here's here's the idea. So, what's the mean? You can think about the mean as the minimizer of, of this function, right? That's that's one definition of, of the mean, and this is a nice convex function. And now uh, we we can try to minimize this function. And uh, the the way we we can do this is that for for any two candidates A and B, we can try to guess which is better. If, if A is a better candidate or B is a better candidate, okay? And uh, so again, this goes by this median of means type kind of uh, idea. So we form, uh, again, we form blocks of the data and, uh, and, and we just take the averages within, within all, all these blocks, okay? So we will only work with these averages, okay? So we partition all these blocks. And now we will say that A defeats B if a is closer to the majority of the, if the majority of, of, of these data centers are closer to A than to B. Okay, so here's in this little picture, there's a, there's a, here's A and here's B. And now we, we count how many of these, these red crosses are the, are the YIs or the YJs, okay? And, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six closer to A and one, two, three, four closer to B. So A is better, okay? So this is uh, this is how we uh, how we compare now uh, uh, candidates, and now for each uh, uh, okay right so so that's that's it that this is this is the, the main idea and I, I will uh, I will say it in a second how how we can uh, we can compute how we can uh, construct an estimator based on this idea, but the main uh, technical uh, property is that the mean. The, the true mean mu will beat, will, will beat, will defeat every vector B that is far away from it. Okay, so if, if, if mu is here and we take a ball of radius R, then mu will defeat everybody that's outside of here. Simultaneous. This, the radius R is exactly of the form that we look for, okay, which is square root of trace of the covariance matrix divided by m plus square root of the, the largest uh, eigenvalue log one over delta divided by m. Okay. All right. So this is, this is the main uh, technical property. And once we have that, it's very easy to, to now, uh, to now um, construct an estimator because for, for, each, uh, for, for each point in, in the space, we can look at uh, the set of those points that defeat, a, that, that defeat A, okay? Now this is a bounded set for each, for each A, okay? Because with points very, very far, far away that are way off uh, are not gonna beat A, okay? So we have this bounded set for, for, for each candidate. And now we look, at, we look for the point that has the smallest radius, for, for which the set of points that beat this point has the smallest radius. Okay, so that's that's the definition of the of the uh, of our estimator, and this estimator is is gonna work. Why? Because uh, by definition, the radius of of uh, of the set defined by mu n hat is smaller than the radius of the set uh, defined at, at the true mean, right? Because we we pick the one that minimizes it, and the radius of of the set of points. Uh, the defeat, uh, the mean is, is smaller than R because of the lemma that I just showed you, okay? But now either, either we don't know if, if mu and hat beats mu or mu 
uh, or mu uh, beats mu n hat, but, but either mu is in this set or mu n is in this set, right? In, in, in any case, then this distance is gonna be smaller than that, okay? So all we need, uh, all we need to understand is this, uh, is this technical lemma that says that the mean actually beats every point that is farther than this distance. Right, so I'm gonna, um, okay, so th this is, this is the, 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 the corollary that we have is that, uh, is that if we choose the, the, the block size, so sorry, the number of blocks the same way as before, log one over delta, then, uh, then we, we probably at least one minus delta, we have the distance, uh, the Euclidean distance of the estimator to the true mean is bounded by this sub Gaussian quantity. The constants, of course, uh, are not optimal. We, we don't expect these constants to be. I, I just put some numbers here that, that work. I'm, I'm sure that we, if you look closer to the proof, you can improve them. And I have no idea what the best constants are. That's, that's an interesting question. What, what, what's the best you can do? For the Gaussian case, we had very nice constants. We had one and one here, right? So, so that was really nice. Okay. Um, all right, so let me uh, just flash out uh, the, the ideas of, of the proof uh, very quickly. So, uh, <clears throat> so we have to prove that mu defeats every, every point that's far away. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just center everything. So instead of B, let's write B minus mu and instead of X. So if, if you wish, we, just, we can just assume that the mean equals zero. So then, then mu will defeat B. If, if we rewrite the, uh, the definition, what it means, it means that on the majority of the blocks, we have this inequality, okay? All right, and, and this has to hold for all vectors whose, whose norm is greater than R. But it's, it's very easy to see that it's enough to prove it for when, when the norm actually equals to R because, because that will imply that it will beat everybody also uh, farther away, okay? Um, now, uh, so let, let's, let's see, so we, we want to prove this for, uh, we want to prove that mu beats every point on the sphere of radius r, okay? So first, let's see what happens for a single point, okay? Now, uh, you see by Chebyshev's inequality, this quantity here is bounded by r squared over two. So this is really easy. So that means that this holds, okay? With, with huge probability, right? This, this holds for, for one block. So for the with, with probability, let's say uh, 90%. So we'll hold for 80% of blocks with probability one minus e to the minus k times a constant. Okay. Again, by just the binomial tail estimate, right? Because it's, it's the same kind of medium of means type of idea. Okay, so so for 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 a single point, uh, this inequality holds with this big probability. Okay, and that now we what we can do is that we discretize the sphere. Okay, uh, so now we can take an epsilon cover of this set, and the relevant metric is now the metric uh, induced by the, uh, by, by the, by the covariance matrix. That, that's the distance under which we want to cover the sphere. And uh, so this set, we are, we are allowed to have e to the k over 100 points, right? Because if we multiply this by a to the k over 100, then, then it's, it's still very small, right? We want to take the union bound over this exponentially many points. So e to, we, we can still afford a to the k over 100. E, e to the k over 100, okay? So we, can, uh, so we can discretize it such that we have this many points. And now you can easily, well, easily, you, you can use the so-called dual Sudakov inequality to show that, uh, that, um, that this epsilon needs to be this quantity, okay? So with the, the epsilon is the, uh, is, is the radius, okay? Uh, so, uh, so now we can take the union bound over this. And the, the third step is, is to control what happens within these little balls, okay? Uh, 
okay? the, 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 the fluctuations over the balls. Okay, so this is a kind of standard covering argument that, that, uh, that, that, is, that is known in, in empirical process theory. And the proof of this uh, third, well, this is kind of standard empirical process theory techniques using telegrams, concentration inequality, and symmetrization, and contraction, and all, all those. If it says something to you, so I know it, to some of these. Okay, so that's uh, that, that's the sketch of the proof. Um, now you see the uh, algorithmically, of course. Uh, I, I, well, this is this is an existence proof, right? And uh, and if you want to implement uh, this estimator, then uh, then it's uh, it's going to be just exponential exponential time in the dimension. So, uh, so in our paper, we, we pose this challenge that try to come up with a, with, with a, a polynomially computable sub-Gaussian estimator. And Sam Hopkins uh, wrote a beautiful paper where, where he basically took our estimator and, and, and uh, constructed a semi-definite relaxation of it. And he proved that it can be computed uh, in polynomial time. Uh, and, uh, and, and it has the same kind of uh, performance guarantees. And, uh, and now, th since then, there has been uh, several papers that improved on, on, this, uh, on, on, this, uh, on this exponent uh, by, by all these authors. Okay, so now there's been, in the, in the theoretical computer science community, there's been a, a flurry of activities about uh, beautiful papers uh, where, where uh, efficient, uh, robust uh, estimation of linear. Okay. Gabor, you, you, you didn't mention the dependence on delta, which has to be known. Is that true for all the papers that you mentioned on the previous slide? The, the dependence of, the, of delta is, is actually necessary. So, so that's, uh, that, that, that is, we proved that in a paper with uh, Luc de Vroy and Mathieu Leral and uh, Roberto Oliveira. So, so if, if you don't want to assume any, anything more than the second moment, then even in one dimension, uh, there's no estimator that, that can be sub-Gaussian simultaneously for all deltas. So, so the, the estimator needs to depend on delta, okay? If, if you know something else, if you have a third moment or something like that, then it's, then it's a different story. Then, then you can come up with, uh, with estimators that, that, are, you know, that are, don't depend on the, on, on the confidence limit, okay? All right, so, um, so the second, um, uh, the second multivariate uh, estimator is uh, is now uh, parallels the uh, the trim mean estimate. It's a generalization of the trim mean estimator. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a different paper with, with Shahar. Uh, um, so here, uh, what we do is is the following. So we we, we again just just in, uh, in in the one dimensional case, we divide the data into two halves. Okay. We, we set this epsilon to be log one over delta over n. This is the trimming level. Okay. And now we compute the empirical epsilon half and one minus epsilon half quantize, right? So we project the data in, into each direction and we compute this quantize, okay? And these are L, uh, alpha sub v and beta sub v, okay? Here, here's a little picture. Okay, so these are our points, uh, and 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 we project on, on on this line here, right? And we we compute the trim mean. We compute the trim mean estimator here. Okay, so this is the trim mean estimator, in that direction, right? So we, we look at uh, we look at the projection. We take the inner product of, of the data with, uh, with with v with, with the direction v v is a unit vector, <coughs> and and compute uh, this one dimensional. Uh, one-dimensional uh, trim mean estimator. Uh, there's a little difference here, which is this Q. Okay. This Q is a, is a positive number. It's a parameter of the algorithm uh, that we need such that, so that somehow this works uniformly in all directions. Okay. So we need, we need to enlarge somehow. We need to go beyond this, uh, this empirical quantize. And now define uh, these slabs that, that, that are here drawn in orange, right? Which is defined here, okay? All right, so, so the, these are slabs. So in each direction, we, we, we compute, uh, so we, we project in, in, into, into a line, 
we compute the empirical mean, and now we take this, the slab around it, where the, the slab has, uh, has a width which is related to this number q. It's epsilon times q, okay? And now we take, we take the intersection of all these slabs, all right? Okay, this is for a specific value of q. We don't know what the right value of q is, so what we do is that we take the, the uh, we, we, we do it for all possible Qs, well, on, on, this, on this dyadic grid, okay? And we take the smallest one, the, the, narrow, the, 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 the narrowest value of, of this group, the smallest Q, such that this intersection is not empty. It contains at least one point, okay? And we can take any point there and that's gonna be our estimate, right? Now, you see, these are nested sets. Right, because, because of, of the way they are defined. Right? So, so there is a smallest one that is, that is not empty. Okay? And, and, it, uh, and, and, and every other set that is not empty will contain that one. Okay? So, so that's, this, is our, this is the definition of our multivariate trim mean estimator. And the main theorem says that if Q is chosen like this, one over epsilon times uh, square root of uh, right epsilon is epsilon is the same as before is square root of, is, is log one over delta so so uh, if we define q this way then gamma gamma q this set is not only not empty it, it contains the true mean with probability one minus delta okay and uh, and now the diameter of of, of uh, gamma q is is at most four epsilon q right that's that's the you see the width of, of, the, uh, of the slab. So in each direction, the width is, is two epsilon q. So the diameter of this set is, is epsilon q. So, the, so if, if mu is in this set, then the estimator is at most this distance to the, uh, to, uh, to, to the mean. And that is exactly of, of the, of the, of the sub-Gaussian form, okay? So I'm not, I don't have time to, to, to go to the proof of this, but this is a, again, an empirical process type of, of proof to, to show that, uh, that these slabs, the intersection of these slabs for, for the correct choice of Q is, uh, is, uh, contains the mu, contains the true mu, okay? So that's the multivariate uh, trim mean uh, estimator. And again, the, the nice property of this is that it is robust under adversarial contamination. Okay. So the exact same estimator, if now we replace epsilon, epsilon before was log one over delta over n, but now we can just take, uh, we can just take um, uh, uh, one, log one over delta, uh, sorry, the, the same value plus, plus eta, plus the contamination level, then it has, uh, it has an error of the form that, that we accept, that expect that has uh, two terms. One of, one of the terms is, is what we have contaminated, and the price of the contamination is, square, is proportional to square root of eta times the square root of the largest variance. Okay, the largest direction of variance. And obviously you cannot, we cannot hope anything better than this because already in one dimension we have that. Okay, so this is uh, again optimal. Now, uh, again, if the distribution is nice, for example, sub-Gaussian, then, then, uh, then this term square root of lambda uh, eta can be replaced by, by something better. Uh, that it has a better dependence on, uh, on eta. It, you can go down almost all the way to eta. And again, it's the, the, the same proof goes through. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the adversarial contamination doesn't, uh, doesn't bother uh, the trim mean estimator. Um, I should say that there's a, there's a, a very nice recent paper of uh, Diaco Nicolas, Kane and Pensia, who, uh, who actually proposed an efficiently computable estimator that uh, achieves the same bound. <clears throat> Uh, under the only assumption that, that, this, that the, the covariance matrix exists and under adversarial uh, computation. Okay. There are some subtleties. So for apparently it seems, and it's, this follows from uh, results of Sam Hopkins and uh, Jerry Lee, that, uh, that you can't, 
hope, can't really hope to improve the square root of eta if you want to stay computationally uh, feasible if you have nicer, this nicer fields, if you have some Gaussian distribution. But that's, uh, um, that's a different issue. I, 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 I'm not talking about the computation, but uh, okay. Now let me uh, close my talk with, with two slides on, uh, <clears throat> on, uh, on work in progress. This is not out yet, but it, it should be out in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, again, uh, joint work with Shahar, where uh, we're looking at uh, what we call direction dependent accuracy. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so the sub-Gaussian performance bounds, you see, we, we, were, we were looking at the Euclidean distance of of the mean uh, of the mean to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the estimate. Okay, so e equivalently, we can we can uh, we can say that the, the, the fact that the norm uh, the norm of the difference is bounded by something that just means that that the uh, the inner product of the difference with, with any unit vector is smaller than that. Okay, now the, the question is what happens if we, if we want to be optimal in each direction, right? Because for for if, if I fix a direction u, then, then we can, in, in that fixed direction, the, the right amount is, uh, is, is the variance in that direction, right? Sigma squared of u, right? Which is the variance of uh, the inner product of x and u. And, uh, and of course, lambda one is just the worst case of that for those sigma squares, okay? So can we replace this worst case part here by something which depends on u. So can, can we replace this sigma one here by sigma squared of u? Okay. And the, if we can, what, what is the price we have to pay here in, in the other term? Okay. So again, uh, to, to get uh, an understanding of this, we, we should go back to the Gaussian case to, to see what happens for Gaussians. The Gaussians are easy to understand. And uh, for Gaussians, we, we, we see what's the best thing that we can, we can ever hope for, okay? Uh, so what one can prove the following. So suppose that we have an inequality of this kind of form, right? This is the same form as before, right? But now here we have the direction dependent accuracy. And here we have some S, some number S that replaces this strong term here, which was the square root of the trace of the covariance matrix divided by N. Then it turns out that uh, this S has to be at least something which is actually smaller than the trace. Right? This is the sum of, for, of, of the eigenvalues, but only the smallest eigenvalues. We can, we can chop off the first log one over delta. And in fact, this is uh, realizable. Right? For the, the empirical mean, you can, you can actually improve this S to, uh, to, to this sum. Okay? So instead of the trace, we can actually have an inequality that, that for in each direction, we have this plus that. Okay. And, uh, okay. and now it turns out that we can actually achieve this uh, just a little bit more than, uh, than the second moment assumption. So what we need to assume is that, is that uh, we have the, what we call uh, LQL2 norm equivalence. So, so we need to assume that that uh, that the some uh, some norm uh, so, some uh, moments of, of order strictly greater than two exist, and they are related to the second uh, to the second moment. For example, if you have sub Gaussian, then th then this is of course true. Okay, and uh, and in that case, we can actually construct an estimator, a mean estimator that has this direction dependent uh, uh, accuracy, the correct direction dependent accuracy, and where the strong term is, is now again, the trace can be replaced by something that, that's, that's even smaller away. And, uh, and the construction of this estimator is kind of complicated. It, uh, it, it's a several, it takes several steps to do it. Um, it uh, um, uh, but but somehow it, it uses ideas from from trimming uh, trimming estimators, and uh, so here are just uh, some references of, uh, of of the papers that I mentioned. So this is the uh, the median of means tournament paper. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, the trimmed mean paper. 
This third one, I didn't talk about it when, uh, instead of the, the Euclidean norm, you can, you can, uh, you can ask uh, what happens if you want to use some other norm okay? as, as, a, as a measure of accuracy. And, uh, and one can also construct uh, optimal estimators, sub-Gaussian estimators in that sense. Of course, again, it has to be understood what sub-Gaussian means under, under different norms. And, and this is that survey that Sasha mentioned at the beginning. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, uh, you Garber. Uh, we'll come do a virtual clap. Any questions? We're on this try. And I'll ask a quick question. So what are the minimal assumptions that you need to avoid this knowledge of delta? Uh, you can have, uh, you can have, uh, so for example, third moment is enough, mm -hmm. but you can replace that by some kind of certain symmetry, weak symmetry assumptions on, on, on the, so there are, there are various ways. So, yeah. So the, the question here is now, if, if we have a class of distributions, how can we estimate the uh, how can we estimate the uh, the mean with, within that class uh, for for all deltas? And this class, there are so we, we have several constructions, but but there's there's not a single one, right? So uh, for example, for the class of distributions with bounded uh, third moment, you we, you can do it for the class of distributions so that has have some kind of symmetry uh, kind of weak symmetry. So the, these these uh, the, uh, the distributions are not very skewed, uh, that, that's also enough. Okay, but, but if you want the class that, that uh, where just the, the variance is finite, that's, uh, that's impossible. Okay, any other questions? Uh, hi, I have a question. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking like for the the median of mean tournament, like how, if there's so many candidates you need to compare, is that, I mean, you may have a continuous set, like, so how it, yeah. will you? Uh, Absolutely, yes. So the, the way I presented it, it, it is a continuous set. <laughs> uh, it, it is just an existence proof. And, uh, but if, if you want to, uh, if you want, uh, an algorithmic ver uh, version of it, then you, sh you have to look at uh, Sam Hopkins's paper. Okay, so, so, um, so for, for me, an estimator is just a measurable function of the data. Okay, that's, that's all I said. And, and, and th what, what I constructed here is a measurable function of the data. Okay, you, you, you look at for, for each point, you can, you can construct these sets, and now you, you look at the set that has a, that has the smallest time area. Okay. Uh, of course, the algorithmic question is, uh, is, is absolutely valid, and, uh, but I didn't talk about it. Uh, in these papers, there are, there are computable uh, algorithms. You, you, can, you can easily make what, what I just uh, said, you can easily make it uh, into an algorithm that's, that takes exponential time. Okay. But that's, that's okay. not different. That's not different. Okay, thank you. I also had a quick question about one of the median estimators, uh, one of the mean estimators, uh, the, the one where you take the ball, which has uh, at uh -huh. least half points. Yeah. Uh, is that one computable in an efficient way? No, it's not. Okay. Got it's it. not. It's, it's also an MP hard problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, but, the, uh, but the, uh, the other one, where was it? Uh, the, 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 uh, this one, the geometric median. The, can you see it? Uh, no, it hasn't changed. No. Okay, it hasn't changed. So. There's some problem with the screen sharing. Okay, anyways, so the, the, the geometric median that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that is uh, computable because it's a, it's a convex optimization problem. And in mm -hmm. fact, in, in computational geometry, that's been, that's been uh, studied a lot and, uh, and refined and there are very fast algorithms to compute. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe you... Um... We should let Gabor enjoy the evening. <laughs>
uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions offline uh, by email. Of course. Unless there's anything pressing. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Gabor. Thank you. Thanks.